Um, so this week we are talking about iteration. Um, so one of the, or as we talked about previously with functions, um, reducing cutting and pasting and duplication in your code is a really good thing. Um, it's easier to see the intent of your code. Your eyes are drawn to what's different, not what stays the same. Um, as your needs change, you only need to make changes in one place, and you're likely to have fewer bugs. And uh, one tool um, to do this is functions, as I said. Another is iteration, um, and that is when you need to do the same thing multiple times, or the same thing to multiple inputs. And so we have a couple types. We have imperative programming. That's where you have for loops and while loops. And they make iteration very explicit. Um, you can definitely see what's happening. Um, and then we also have functional programming. Um, and that is where common for loop patterns get their own functions. So you can streamline your code even more. And we will load up some packages. Okay, and <clears throat> so for loops can be made in basic R, which I believe is the imperative kind, and then the tidyverse package contains per, which has ready-made for loops, which are the functional type. Um, so we'll start with for loops. And so we again have some repetitive code like we saw in the function section. And we just have a data frame with A, B, C, and D as columns. And we're trying to find the median of each of those columns. And you can see we have this written out. Um, and that's again where there's a cut and paste and you might uh, type one of the letters wrong. Um, so instead we can use a for loop. Um, and so we have a vector here and we are saying for each I or each item in the sequence along data frame. So for each I in each thing in the data frame, um, we are picking one of those items and taking the mean of one of those items or columns, and then we get an output, maybe. OK, so you can see we have the same result as the previous chunk of code. So each for loop has three components. So we have an output. Um, in this case, it's a vector of doubles the length of the number of columns. And you should allocate enough space for your for loop. Um, a loop that grows at iteration will be very slow in quotes. I wasn't sure exactly like how slow is slow. <laughs> it depends, but it can okay. have a huge impact. And okay. this is like for loops are kind of famous in okay. R for being slow. And he mentions it in the chapter of um, if someone tells you that for loops are R, in R are slow, don't take that as an insult to your own code. Take it as an insult to themselves because they don't understand how to make for loops fast in R. Um, and it is, it's mostly this. If you predefine the outlook, output, for loops are like the same. The apply functions are just like hidden for loops, basically. So don't feel bad for using for loops. But a lot of times it's easier to use other things. Um, but yeah, the, the predefining the output, that's actually something I'm dealing with in a package that I manage right now that we don't oh. properly predefine the output. And so nice. I was like, oh yeah, that's exactly, <laughs> yep. It was really funny reading the chapter and okay. seeing that. <laughs> so yes, it can be slow, not in quotes. <laughs> um, <clears throat> the second part, of the loop is the sequence. So for each item in each sequence of numbers along the columns of the data frame, um, sequence along is a safe version of the familiar one, two, length x. 
So if you have a zero length vector, sequence along will tell you. Um, and then we have the body, which in this case is um, output for each item is the median for each item. So this is the code that does the work. It loops each time with a different value for i. And you can see the difference between the sequence along and the one to length here. <clears throat> so we have a vector of length zero. So this tells you, and the other um, option just returns a one and a zero. <laughs> Um, so we just to, to pause on that for a second. If you think about it, if you did the for loop using the one to length zero, it would do the for loop once for one, and then it would do it again for zero. Whereas oh, okay. with the integer zero, if you do a for loop saying i in integer zero, it just doesn't do it. It says, oh, okay, I do it zero times. Okay. Um, and so that's why he was saying, like, you'll get weird errors because you're like, you know, there is no zeroth object. What's going yeah. on? You know, um, yeah. Okay, that's helpful. Thank you. <laughs> um, so, uh, as far as for loops are concerned, we have four variations. So, we can modify an existing object instead of creating a new object. We can loop over names or values instead of indices. And we can handle outputs of unknown length. And we can handle sequences of unknown length. <clears throat> but again, I think those are the ones where it gets into kind of a dicey slow area. So for the first style, um, we have modifying an existing object. And uh, we have an example of rescaling every column in a table, um, which we went through in functions. So we have our little table that we created. And then we want to rescale. Uh oh, sorry, my mouse is acting up again. Let's see if I can get back up there. OK, there we are. Um, so we want to rescale every column. And then down here in the output, we have, again, our cut and paste issue. So how can we make this a loop? Um, well, the output is the same as the input. So basically, it's the same data. We're just uh, rescaling it. Um, for the sequence, we can iterate over each column with sequence along. And then in the body, we can apply our rescale function. So right down here, we have the above code in a for loop. And typically, you'll be modifying a list or a data frame with this sort of loop. So remember to use the double brackets, not the single brackets, which um, when Lucy was presenting, the last chapter, we had a very <laughs> in-depth discussion of this. And so um, just a reminder, the single bracket selects a subset of an object and the double brackets extracts one item. And so these are all the examples that we went through uh, last week. Uh, before you go on, I wanted mm -hmm. to point out in the out when he says um, output's already defined, it's the same as the input. Mm -hmm. Think of that output step as you're setting up like the shape of the output, like you're ah, making okay. a container for the output. And so it has the same shape. The actual values inside of it are different, um, but you have, you know, each of the columns exist already. Okay. That makes a lot more sense. Thank you. <laughs> you're welcome. Okay, and so I will not go through all of the uh, examples we went through last week about the single and double brackets. Okay, so we have the second style of for loops, um, looping patterns. There are three 
basic ways to loop over the vector. So we've already seen the for i in sequence along. Um, we can also loop over the elements. So for each x in xs, this is good for side effects, um, outputs of plots, and saving a file because it's difficult to save the output efficiently. And I wasn't sure why um, it's difficult to save. Like, what does that mean, saving something efficiently? Could this be really, <clears throat> excuse me, could this be related to the for loop being a base R function versus using a package in the tiny verse, uh, tidy verse, the, the per package? That makes sense. Kind of. Um... I, I actually, that, that line kind of caught me too. I was like, I'm not sure exactly what he means by okay. that. Um, so how oh, you... oh, okay, okay, okay. Um, say that, I think what he's trying to say is, let's say you have just a whole bunch of different things to save um, and it doesn't make sense to save them in one file. I think that's what he meant by efficiently, that you, you need to save a different file for each of the things. That would be a case that he means here. Um, hmm, okay. I think. Um, so, how would you explain the four x in xs? Um, it's saying that you want to do a thing for each member of the thing. Um, Which, so, and yeah. you, the variable you're using is the member not the position within the member so um a lot of times like if you have a character vector a lot of times it'll make sense to say for you know for this word in words for example and i want to mm. do something for each of those words and i want ah, the actual okay. value not the position within it i don't care about the position within it because i'm not going to update it or whatever i just care about what the actual value is um, okay. but a, a lot of the time, the reason that he calls this out is different is a lot of the time what you're doing is updating that position within the vector, or you're saving it to another vector, things like that. And so, um, a lot of the time you do want the position, but sometimes you don't, sometimes you want the actual thing um, okay. and, and you don't care where it is. And to be clear, a lot of times you want the actual thing and the position. And if you know the position, you can get both of them. But if you only know the actual thing, it's hard to go backwards and get the position. Huh, okay. So that's what that's all about. Okay. And then um, the third way to loop over a vector is looping over the names. So for each NM in names XS, um, this gives you a name which you can use to access the value with X and then the specific item NM. I think, did that make sense? <laughs> uh, yeah, but and so the name can still be useful as a position if, like he, he points out, give your output the same names as the input, and then you can refer to the output by the same names as the input. He has code showing that, yeah, the results, um, your okay. next block of code. Yes. Oh, right, because I had a question about that. I was like, <laughs> yes. what does this do? And so, yeah, okay. the point of that is you're setting up an output vector that has the same names as the input vector, except X doesn't exist in your code right now. And so it can't uh, evaluate. Yeah, do you? So just set that with put eval equals false in the, the R next to the word R or the letter R. That way you can include it, but it doesn't try to run it um, because it can't run, X doesn't exist. Another way to do it would be to set up a vector that has names. Um, try, I don't think there's anything built in that is a vector with names. Um, would that be our little Tibble data frame that we created? Um, a lot of times what I use would be, um, let's, let me type some code really quick. Um, oops. 
right? Yeah, there we go. So a quick example of a named vector is you can use the month name and month ab uh, built in character vectors to build one that is. So what that makes is a vector of the names of the month and the names of that vector are the abbreviations. And so you could say like X uh, Jan to get January, for example. I use that as a quick way to have a named vector to play with. Um, hope that makes sense. <laughs> oh, you're muted, Ryan. <laughs> I'm muted. Sorry, too. I'm just watching what, oh. what Becky's doing. And, and <laughs> I was muted out loud. too. <laughs> like, I'm not Ryan. <laughs> so I didn't. It's funny because I was looking at the people and not at the <laughs> your code. Yes, you're also muted. So um, okay. Now you're not. But good. Um, yeah. Okay. So just exactly that, and then that way now results has names just like X. Um, and if you call, if you at the end of that code put results, so we can see the output from results Whoa. without caps. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yes, I'm very anxious to get my results. <laughs> okay. So results is a list that has those same named, those same names as we set up. Huh. Okay. Does that make sense? Length. Um trying to work through it in my <laughs> head <laughs> okay and yeah my code is actually the like the quick version of his okay. code yeah um, you could say you're doing a list of the length of the names of the month and then right names length okay so that's names with the results list, and then we're picking out. Yeah, I'm still not quite sure what this line does. That sets the names of the vector that you just created to be the same as the names of X. Oh, OK. Because before that, it, it didn't have names. It, it is it was an unnamed vector. And that's just setting you up to have those names. That way, if you do the for loop by name, you can refer to that position within your output vector with that same name. OK. And you know, a lot of times, that'll be useful. Um, if you wanted to have one vector is the names of the months, and then another vector is like the profit for that month, let's mm. say. And that's what you're setting okay. up in your for loop, Okay. for example. Thank you. Yeah. And then just to close it all out, his code is, um, he kindly showed it in base R. You can do the same thing that he does at, at per the set names function from per. I can't remember if we saw that. Um, I don't before. believe that's. It's a, it's a way to be able to set the names of a thing in line instead of having to call the names function. Um, because you know names results gets names x um you need to put you can't put that in a pipe basically whereas set names you can put into a pipe hmm. okay and um as you can see this code is much more streamlined <laughs> and we'll talk about that a little bit later yeah because per is awesome <laughs> it is per per is like the the superhero package like people was... <laughs> often will tweet oh i finally started to learn per and oh my god my code is so much easier to read now or things like that. so um it it's it has some difficulty like there are there are things in per that i like um actually set names is one that i didn't even know existed until relatively recently and i'm like oh god all these extra lines where I have to stop and set the names and then continue with the pipe. Now you can just put it inside of the pipe. Um, and so yeah, Per has lots of useful stuff in it and we will see more and more of that. Okay, so 
iteration over the numeric indices is the most general form because it gives the position you can extract both the name and the value. And I think, John, you just mentioned that earlier. Um, oh, no, it's it did it. OK. But we're not going to see an output <laughs> because because um, there's not really anything to output. Um, OK, so. Mm -hmm. Before we go on to this yes. section, can I ask a question on uh, the first exercise? So if you scroll up, let me look it up. Uh, OK, it's the one, I think it's 1B, uh, write four loops to determine the type of each column in New York City flights 13. Uh, uh, yes. Flights. So. Um, yeah, so it's exercise 1.2. Yeah. So I've got it right here. So perfect. Uh, okay. So my question there was um, he's using a list, right, to create the output. Why can't you use a character? Because aren't those all character types? Or I feel like I'm missing something. Uh, oh, he's using a list. Um, he's using a vector of type list. And I was like, but the outputs all seem to be characters. So why couldn't you just put them all in one character vector? Or is that not how character vectors work? Um, I need to see the okay. code. Where, where are we? <laughs> I'm sorry, uh, I was in sorry, my it's way okay. the, yeah. um, It's right here. OK. So, okay, we're setting up the type of flights. Um, <laughs> oh, the reason he did that, did, run that code. And okay, and yep. can you all see the output window? Mm -hmm. Okay. See, the, go ahead and scroll down to the bottom because the last one showed what I wanted to show. Notice that time hour has mm -hmm. two classes. And mm -hmm. if you did a character vector, it would try to put those two things in one position. And you can only have one oh. thing in that one position. OK, OK, OK. Got so it. that's, yeah, Got that's it. why it's a list. And then each okay. element of the list is a character vector. Yeah. Most of those yeah. are a length one character vector. But some of them can be a length two or more. Sometimes you could have a column that has oh. who knows okay. how many different classes. So yeah. That's actually, that is a good example that he kind of sneaks through of, okay. um, uh, you'll see that, like, let's change the vector to character and run the code so we can watch it break <laughs> and see the error and message. Can you remind me, is it the full name or just I, I think it's character all the okay. way out. Um, okay, so yeah. That. Error in type flights. So there, it, that's actually really explicit. That's kind of nice. More elements <laughs> supplied than there are to replace. So that's saying, you sent me two, and I only have room for one. So I don't know what to do. Um, so oh, yeah. Oh, OK, OK. It's that, like there are not enough spots to accommodate for all of these. Right. In because that case. Got because it. in each step, you're saying, OK, at position one, I want to put the class. And mm -hmm. if that class is two things long, it's like, but position one can only hold one thing. What do you mean you want to give me two things? Yeah, yeah, yeah. OK, OK, that, that makes sense. Because I was just like, well, but the output looks like a character vector. So why not just you know arrange them all? OK, cool. Thank you. Yep. You're welcome. OK. Thank you, Becky. Yeah, you're welcome. Okay, so another um, style that we can have is an unknown output length. Um, sometimes you might not know how long the output will be. Um, if you attempt to solve this by progressively growing the vector, R has to copy all the data from the previous iteration so it can get exponentially longer. And that's what slows things down, right? That we were talking about earlier. Um, 
So a better way to deal with this is um, this. Uh, unlist flattens a list of vectors into a single vector. Um, per flatten double is stricter, it will throw an error if the input is in a list of doubles. Okay, so we have um, this vector or this collection of numbers um, and we're making a vector, the list, the length of means. So it's a list of three vectors. Um, and for each I item in sequence long means, we are doing something, we're sampling. <laughs> um, so yeah, sample is, um, it takes, okay, let me make sure I have the arguments right before I try to well, explain I, it. Yeah, I looked it up and I still wasn't sure what was happening. That, is that, um, that would just be one, Hundred every time, right? Oh, oh, right. Yeah, because base R does weird things sometimes. <laughs> okay. Um, so, in in sample, um, when it is a length one that you give it for that first argument, so you gave it one hundred, it's saying um, one to one hundred. So out of out of one to one hundred, select one thing. Oh, okay. <clears throat> So uh, yeah, I always forget like the normal or a normal way to do it. We give it a you know a list of things that are um, possible answers and randomly select one of them. So out of um, months, you know the month dot name thing that I like to use, you could say select one. He'll choose a random month out of that list of months. Um, but he is just using it for pick a random number between one and a hundred. And oh, okay. then for each output, um, he is putting in a, uh, a, a whatever, a, a normal um, distribution for that mean um, with that number, around that number. Let me, again, make sure I'm getting calling the arguments correctly. All right is uh, n is the number of observations. And then the second argument is the mean of that observation. So yeah. OK. We... <laughs> so <clears throat> the first output is, <clears throat> excuse me, the list of three. And the second is where it's um, flattened into a single vector. OK, yes. So yeah, so each time through that loop, it's picking a random number between one and 100, and then it's producing that many observations at that mean. I don't know why you would ever want to do exactly this, but. <laughs> um, I was going to say, is this useful for anything? So a lot of times you'll use sample, R norm, functions like that to um, simulate, you know, you do something. You get different amounts of data back. You're doing something fancy. Um, who knows what you're doing? You're collecting data from some sensor, and sometimes the sensor has one output, and sometimes the sensor has a thousand outputs. <laughs> and so that's kind of what he's trying to simulate here. Oh, okay. <laughs> Please allow me to ask a question. So um, regarding this particular for loop, so we are looking at just go up. Scroll up. I'm, a tiny bit. I'm trying. Oh, <laughs> my my mouse is uh, not happy. Okay, so yep. is this far enough up? Yes. Okay. I have been trying to understand the for loop, so allow me to ask a question. So we are we are first of all looking at the sequence of the number of means based on the output, the above um, vector that you had. And um, so we're looking at, we, for n, we want uh, one value out of the 100 values that you have been given as understood from Johnny. But then we have to look at the out. So the out, I, 
I don't understand <laughs> what exactly is happening in that particular line of code. Yeah, I I oh. understand it's drawing a distribution. Okay, well, it's drawing a sample from the normal distribution. But yeah, are they two things? But you're choosing to look at the 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 output as the out itself. Yeah, so I hope it makes sense. Um, what so what it's doing? If we look at like the the first output, the list of three, the first time through the loop, it created a um, a vector um, with length twenty nine of just a bunch of different random numbers around a mean of zero because the the first mean is zero and then the second mean is one so then it randomly created a vector of length three around a mean of one and then the third time it's mean two so it created happened to choose 13 as its random number and it created a vector of 13 observations around a mean of two um Yeah, so that's the structure of the the output is that thing, and then he's saying, whatever you're doing here, you're trying to generate a bunch of random numbers that um, you're going to use for some other thing, with some so structure within the numbers, and then you can flatten that, so you can unlist that, and now you have just a simple numeric vector from of all of those numbers in one thing. Again, by because it's fake data, it makes it a little bit harder to follow. Why? Like, why would you do this? But you know, you're doing some process that. Um, let's say uh, you're just like collecting the sales for something, whatever, some sort of sales, and you have to do it by day. And so you're going through and collecting it by day. But for whatever you're doing, you don't really care what day the sale was on, whatever, whatever me, you know reason you have for that and but he's saying collect it still day by day in your for loop and then flatten it and that that stops r from having to deal with um slowly growing the vector and that's where things get slowest when you slowly grow the vector so oh, okay <laughs> that yeah <helps. laughs> so yeah again out at the beginning you set up the shape of out which is i'm going to have three sets of data and so I'm setting up an out vector that has three places to put data. And then you fill those places and then you flatten out back out because you don't actually care about the separation between those three places. Um, and, and like the other piece of that is, you know that, um, you know, there will be three places, you know, that the loop, you need to call the loop three times. You need to call it once for each mean. And so set it up for each of those calls. Um, each time through the loop, have a place to store the stuff, and then flatten it. Versus, you could just append it onto the end of a vector. Um, the, and this is like pretty close to exactly this case is what I am fixing in a package right now. So it was really nice to read this and go, oh, okay. Um, but it, when you try it, like there is a function in R called append. If you have append inside of a loop, you're doing it wrong. Um, so. <laughs> That is uh, something I'm dealing with right now. And it's like exactly this case that I'm going to want to pre-allocate the vector with kind of the list, the length of how many times might, in my case, I'm actually using a while. So I don't know how many times I'm going to go through the loose loop, but I know the maximum number of times I could go through the loop. So I'm going to pre-allocate my vector to that maximum length, fill all the, the values in, and then flatten it because I don't actually care about which time through the vector or which time through the loop did this thing happen. Um, and it's again, all about setting up that thing with a shape and then filling it in is the way to make for loops and while loops in R efficient. And you will hear it like someone might read your code and say, oh, you've got a for loop, you're doing this wrong. Sometimes you're doing it wrong just because it's hard to read, but it's not slow as long as you do it, as long as you pre-allocate the size and then do it. Um, some, I don't think uh, map, oops, I don't think map is a for loop, but there are, um, yeah, he's, he has it all written in C, but there are, there are some things that people are like, oh no, don't use a for loop, use this other function. And if you look at the code of that function, it's a for loop, he just does it for you. 
So you're not wrong um, if you're using a for loop necessarily. <laughs> and yeah. That's making a lot of things in the rest of the chapter make sense to me now. <laughs> <laughs> Yay. <laughs> Can I ask a dumb, unnecessary question? Absolutely. No <laughs> <laughs> okay. So it always will unlist in the order of your original lists, right? So what I see this in this num bracket one through 45, which is like the unlisted version is list, I guess, one, then two, then three, right? Yes. Okay. Yeah. So it, it, it's, it puts the second thing after the first thing and the third thing after, you know, at the end after that, it creates a new vector or, well, yeah, it creates a new vector. That's just the flat version of that. Um, is order, there a right? way okay. that we can see all of the output? Of just if, like kind of et cetera dots. If you had just done out and unlist out, it would show all of the output, and that's actually part of why he did the STR ah, to okay. make it because what we really care about is the structure. We want to see that it's three pieces; they have okay. their own lengths, and then when you string them together, they're one length. Okay. Yeah. I I will not uh, <laughs> look at everything. <laughs> <clears throat> Okay, so um, other places this is useful, you might be generating a long string instead of piecing together each iteration. Save the output in a character vector and then combine that vector into a single string with paste and output collapse. Um, I don't know, does anyone want to see an example? I was just curious what that might look like, but. If it's too complicated, you can skip it. <clears throat> Would it be similar to the previous example, except that instead of generating, I guess, lists, you'd just be generating character vectors, but same in principle? Um, and, and actually, you'd be generating a list of character vectors is the idea. A, a lot of times, or well, actually, I think okay. I think in this example, exact example, you are generating a character vector, but you could also generate a list of character vectors that then you paste together. You know, if you think about if you're doing some oh. somehow like generating text using mm -hmm. some sort of formula, probably at the end you just want a single character, either a single character vector or maybe even just a single. Um, position within a single character vector, like a length one character vector. Mm, okay. But to get there, you might have all this structure that you have to do as you're choosing things. And again, okay. adding on to the character vector to the end of it over and over and over is slow versus just make your list and then at once, all at once at the end, flatten it, paste it together, do whatever else you have to do to, to make your thing. Um, okay. This advice, like, if you have something that uh, has to run a gazillion times, this piece of advice right in here about like the pre-allocate the shape and then fill the shape is really, it's a really big deal. Like I said, I screwed it up and I need to go back and fix it in a package right now. And it is really funny. Like, I don't know, two days ago, I was talking to um, a coworker. I'm like, oh, you know, I think we can make this work by pre-allocating it and deal with it. I, I've, I've read that somewhere. And then I read this chapter and I was like, oh yeah, <laughs> okay. <laughs> so. And, and just a quick follow-up then, but for character vectors, why do you need this pace? Why couldn't you just say unlist like we did before? Uh, so it's saying in this case, we're trying to make a single piece of output, a, a, like a paragraph out of the character vector. And so that collapse equals quote, quote would collapse the character vector altogether. Here, let me do a real quick, um, again, using my favorite. Uh, OK, yes. And I'm going to show you the reason that you often want collapse equals space, not collapse equals nothing. Um, so a couple of examples right there with month name. If you use the collapse equals quote, quote, then it's just going to smash them all together into one length one character vector. Um, if you use collapse equals space, then it'll smash them together into a length one character vector with spaces in between each of the pieces. 
Um, oh, and Ryan had to hop off, but oh. um, huh? Okay, I guess I'm still slightly confused because say that from the previous example, right? Instead of generating a list of three that were numbers, they were characters. Why couldn't you just enlist it like we did? You, you could if okay. what you wanted was a long character vector. And he's, but he's saying in the example where you're trying to paste text together, mm -hmm. don't paste at every step. So like adding, you know, step one, we have January. Step two, we have January, February. Step three, we have January, February, March. Doing that update each time instead of just, okay, I'm going to fill in my positions and then I'm going to paste them all together. Okay. Okay. Um, a lot of times, I I like, understood. Yeah. So um, it's not the same thing as like pre-allocating the shape, basically. Yes. Okay. Yeah. And, and it's well, it's strongly related. Um, any, like, I don't have a, a good, a strong rule on this, but like, anytime you're working with something that's aimed at output for humans, like paste, it's probably good to try to do that just once. Um, I don't know if that's a, a real rule, but like, you know, the reason we're pasting it all together is just to to make it um, instead of we don't want it to be a character vector anymore. We want it to be a paragraph. Mm, and so okay, okay. let's just do that once at the end instead of as we're going, um, because you're making well. And if we think about um, when we talked about character vectors, we learned that each different character vector has a place in memory. So oh, right. January has a place, February has a place, March has a place. If you try to string, add that string at the end each time, you'd have one string that is January, and then you would have January, February, and then you would have January, February, March, et cetera. And so you're creating these extra things in memory that you don't actually want. You only want the one that's everything pasted together at the end. Um, so yeah, that's why it's slow. And again, it's like exactly the problem I'm dealing with. It's, well, very close to that. So um, that actually thinking through that, that is why RAM is blowing up in what I'm doing. I think that I'm creating a bunch of character vectors that I don't actually use. So um, yeah. Hmm. And then this one that he's, the, the um, binding things together. This is another one that's really big create a list of data frames and then bind them together instead of adding a row in each loop can make a huge difference in the speed. Oh, okay. That makes a lot more sense now too. <laughs> <laughs> wow, okay. And so just to um, reiterate what you said, John, you wanna pre-allocate the shape and then set up the structure basically? And then fill in. Fill in. Yeah, so I would say, you know, shape, structure, kind of synonyms that you want to pre-allocate the shape or the structure, the, the thing that you're going to make, and, and then, then fill, and then fill in. in the data. Like it's, it's kind of separating out the shape versus the data. Um, okay. That, that is super helpful. I want to put that like at the very top of the chapter. <laughs> um, okay. Uh, so uh, any more questions? I, okay. I have a slightly silly question. So mm -hmm. why is he using an R bind example? So I guess in this case, at each iteration, you are generating a set of observations, right? As opposed to a new column in some kind of a data frame, right? Because you're binding by row instead of doing the C bind column bind. Right. Um, okay, okay. Yeah, this is specifically that you want to do um, a bunch of rows. But uh, right. okay. it it the same so the same idea holds for columns except columns are positions within a list so usually if you're adding a column you can just preallocate the number of columns you're going to have and then fill yeah. in each column as you go yeah that um, makes sense. but again if you don't know how many columns you're going to have creating a list that is however long you might need fill in the spaces um, and then well. And then at that point, you already still already have the data frame. So maybe um, it depends exactly what you're doing. But right. yeah, a named list yeah. okay. that you then turn into columns is often useful. 
Um, the 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 new thing that I'm sorting out is, um, you know, like I said, we have a case where we don't know how long. Oh, actually, it's it's a little bit of three and four. We don't know how long the output's going to be. We're doing a while, and we don't know how long it's going to be. But we know the maximum that it could be, and that's what what we're going to do is create this structure that can hold up to that maximum size, okay. fill it in, and then basically, I'm not sure yet if it's going to end up being on unlist slash flatten or if it's going to be just drop the empty pieces, but something like that, that we then go, oh, okay, now we don't need this extra piece, but we only have to do that logic once at the end instead of each time it's creating a new thing. Right, right. Um, oh, okay, okay. Yeah. That makes sense. Great, thank you, John. You're welcome. So the last, um, uh, yes. sorry, just, just interrupt you, but I see you all stuck. Is that just me? Oh, um, I nope. don't see anyone I else see that's stuck. I see R now that you moved. And... No. no. That was just you, I think. Um, uh -oh. Okay. <laughs> Sorry, you missed it. <laughs> we oh. had a good conversation. No, no, I see. Yeah, I can hear you. But oh, okay. Just okay. Nice okay. Thing. That's funny. That's okay. okay. That's okay. Um, well, we were just talking about this statement. <laughs> um, if you can see it now. Um, so uh, sometimes you don't know how long the input sequence should run for. Um, this is common when doing simulations. Like if you're simulating a coin toss and you want to loop until you get three in a row. Um, for this, you can use a while loop. It's simpler than a for loop. Um, remember the for loop has output sequence and body. Um, the while loop only has two components, a condition and a body. And for that reason, because it's simpler, um, you can rewrite any for loop as a while loop, but you cannot rewrite every while loop as a for loop. So, um, oops, these are two pieces of code that do the same thing um, for each I in sequence long, do whatever's in the body. Um, and the while loop looks like you're setting i equal to one, and while i is less than or equal to the length, um, you do a thing and then you increase the count of i. And we are getting ready to start 2.21.4, um, and I'm fine to keep going and see how far we get. I think. I think we could do the um, the intro okay. and, and kind of set up what to think about. And then we'll go into the, we'll see where we get. But I think that's probably where okay. we want to stop. So um, now we're looking at for loops versus the functionals. Um, so for loops are not as important in R as they are in other languages. And I can attest to that. I'm currently learning Python. <laughs> um, R is a functional programming language. That means it's possible to put for loops in a function and then call that function instead of using the for loop directly. So basically you can put a function in a function, which kind of blew my mind. <laughs> um, um, so again, looking at our data frame, we have our little tibble here with four columns. And say that we want to take the mean of each column. We could do that with our trusty for loop. Um, so we have this output, which is a vector of a certain length, and then for each item in the data frame, we're going to output, um, we're going to set the output equal to the mean of that thing. So we can see we have all of our means here. Um, but then you realize that you're going to want to do this frequently. Um, so you turn it into a for loop. And so we have now um, our function with our for loop inside. And then 
then you realize you're probably going to be doing other statistical things with this data frame, like median and standard deviation. But this means copying and pasting and writing over the word mean. So we add an argument to the function to supply it with the functions. <laughs> so you can see in the function here, we have our data frame, but we also have the option to pass a function. And then in the output down here, um, this is where the function that we supply will do its thing. And so you can see down here, it's just super easy to call a function with a function. And then um, even better than that, rather than writing your own, base R and the per package have functions for many common loops. Um, base R ones are similar to the ones in per, but per is more consistent. And the author says, therefore, more easily learned. Um, the goal of using per functions instead of for loops is to allow you to break common list manipulation challenges into independent pieces. So say you have um, a problem that you need to solve for a single element of the list. Um, once you've solved that, per takes care of generalizing your solution for every element in the list. And then you can also do that if you have a complex problem, you can break it down into simpler um, bite-sized pieces that you can also apply per to. And so the structure makes it easy to solve new problems. It also makes it easier to understand your solutions to old problems when you reread your code. Yeah, and I think um, let's not go to 21.5 yet. Okay. Um, but just the general idea that stressing that the, the purpose of these is to make your code like cleaner, not necessarily better. Like, you know, I, I think this is the part where he tells or talks about that anyone saying that for loops are bad doesn't know <laughs> modern R. Um, but it's not, you know, it's not that for loops are bad, it's that it's hard to read. Um, you might forget to do the pre-allocation and per does a lot of the pre-allocation for you, things like that, that just let the per functions deal with the things that make for loops hard. And it tells, it, it like sets up um, the, what are you doing with that function? You know, like he talks mostly about map, but then he, we have, um, you know, we have different functions within per that are four different types of for loops. And so by doing it that way, it, it like kind of tells you, tells future you, and it tells other people reading your code. This is why, this is the kind of for loop I want to do. I want to do a map that creates logical output or whatever. And we're going to talk about that. You know, I want to map over all of my inputs and create a logical output. Um, or I want to walk or I want to, um, was it reduce? which is, we'll talk about different things um, next week, but it's uh, it's a way to tell, to, to put more of your intent clearly into your code that you're telling people, this is what I meant here. Um, there's a, like, I think we might have talked early on in functions about commenting code. I can't remember if that came up. Um, and yeah, I think, I think it was here that I was, that he was pointing out that the, the purpose of a comment is to like explain why you did something, not to explain what you did because the code explains what you did. Um, there are people who, who say, and I don't totally disagree, that if you write the names of functions well, and if you write the names of arguments well, you don't even need comments to explain the why sometimes because the function tells you why. Like function tells you what you're doing and it can just, it makes your code easier to just read and know what you're doing. Um, and so that's, that is the whole, per like, I like that he pointed out the purpose of per is to make your code like easier to read. It's to make it easier for a human. It doesn't do anything to make, I mean, it does have some C under the hood that makes some things faster, but for the most part, it's just to make it easier for other humans. Um, that is like a big push that Hadley has is he, he wants, um, it's like, you know, computers are good at code. You don't have to make code easier for computers. Make it easier for humans. Let the right things so that whatever, we figure it out for the computer, but 
um, versus there are people who want to make like code as short and concise as it can be. And he's like, eh, make it wordy, make it like, make it actually make sense to the human because the human is the more important piece of that puzzle. Um, so that's, I think thinking of per as that, it's like, it's not a replacement for for loops. It's a way to make your for loops just easier. Um, and that therefore it becomes a replacement, but it's not like, really an alternative. It's just creating the for loop for you. It's just doing it cleaner. Um, and then the other thing I wanted to point out and actually might technically come up in the next part, but I like that he calls things like map and add or so nope, never mind. It's later. It's later. <laughs> Map's still a function. And it's a what a functional, I think is technically what they call it, where a function takes a function as an argument, but um, so yeah, next week we'll continue uh, going into per the, the beautiful, awesome package. <laughs> oh, I've, I have trivia about the per package. You are muted, Becky. Um, I obsessively, I was like, why is per called per? Like, what is the point there? And there is a concept among or in functional programming that apparently Hadley was obsessed with for a while called pure functional programming, where you want to, I don't know, you're, you're like doing everything as functionals. And I, I don't know, there are rules. I don't know functional programming from a like philosophical standpoint. So I don't know all of this, but there's this concept, pure functional programming. And he was writing a package to do pure functional programming in R. So he called it purer. And then basically, he didn't like that name. It's like, this sounds, I don't know, like I think too much of myself. And so he was trying to come up with a way, what could it be that it still is that thing? Um, and so he just turned the E into an R and he wanted it to be five letters because D plier was five letters and tidy R was five letters. And so he wanted it to match. He wanted his library call to be clean at the top of his um, code. And so per with three R's. Um, I always that that me. Yeah. <laughs> bug me because I'm like, is it two R's? Is it why is there an unnecessary third R? But now I get it. So that helps actually. Yeah. I so heard it, the same question. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and you know that oh sorry, just that the joke or whatever the, the thing that people say is that it's it makes your code purr. <laughs> <laughs> So. I was very disappointed there were no cats involved in that story. <laughs> like his cat walked. Also, Hadley his likes board. cats. I, I, okay. I'm pretty sure he likes cats because there's um, purr and there's uh, four cats is the factors oh. package. Um, he 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 uh, dashed my hopes. There is a famous um, kiwi cat, a, new, a cat from an island on New Zealand. That is famous because it drove a bird. It's blamed for bird, driving a bird extinct, and it's oh. Tibbles the cat. So I was convinced that he had named Tibble after Tibbles the cat because he's from New Zealand. But no, he uh, he just named it Tibble because that's how people were pronouncing TBL. <laughs> oh. So anyway, but he I I get the impression that he does like cats. He does reference cats in a lot of packages. So all right. And with that, I think we can uh, meet next week and talk more about making our code purr. All right. <laughs> All right. Thank you, Jen. Bye. 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 You're welcome. Thanks. <laughs>